Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It is Friday, November 11th, 2022. It's my great privilege to be here with Ted Jenkins. Ted, it's great to be with you. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you for talking to me. Ted, to start, would you please tell me your current title and institutional affiliation here at Caltech? Um, well, my current title is I'm a, a you know, I'm a, a member of the board of trustees, and I've I've done that. Um, and uh, I, as I said, I've had uh, I've got some other connections uh, uh, with uh, on on some uh, advisory committees. And uh, as as uh, as I mentioned, uh, I'm uh, uh, a past president of both the alumni association and the associates, and I I stay active with the uh, associates. Um, theoretically, as an emeritus um, uh, president, I can uh, or chair, I can um, go to all of the board meetings. I don't, but I do go to some, and uh, it's uh, it's good to stay involved. And in fact, uh, I'll be down there for the uh, uh, the holiday party that they'll have uh, the day after um, the double E <laughs> advisory committee. Oh, meeting. that's great! So I'll see you there too. That's wonderful. Okay, are you, oh, you're going, huh? Absolutely. Good, good. Ted, beyond Caltech, do you have any other affiliations in terms of the world of philanthropy, nonprofits? Do you sit on any board, any other boards? Um, I do not. Um, I mean, uh, Caltech is, uh, has been my passion, and I, I think uh, from a philanthropic standpoint, I'm, I really like to focus. I mean, the combination of education and the science uh, a research and everything else is just, uh, you know, motivation and extremely gratifying to stay involved with. Ted, we'll develop the, this in the narrative as we come to it, but was there a specific point in your career at Intel where you became inspired to really become active with Caltech Affairs as an alumnus? Um, yeah, and, and uh, this is something that uh, I think is, uh, it, it's really your whole uh, life's history that uh, affects that. When I when I graduated uh, um, and went to work, I went to Fairchild for a couple of years and then Intel for the rest of my career. But, um, you know, you feel kind of uh, worn out <laughs> when you graduate from here because it's, it is hard work. And, um, you know, you uh, after you get on board in uh, industry, which is really what I wanted to do, um, I you find out uh, how special your preparation was and you start getting more and more positive about it. So um, before children or when they're young, uh, you, you've got time to engage in some of these things. And uh, so I did. I was, uh, uh, you know, I would stay involved in the alumni events and uh, went to seminar day and uh, all of that stuff. And uh, they used, uh, in those days they had um, the reunions uh, uh, linked with seminar day, you know, every five years. And so um, those, those were, that was my, that was my major involvement. And, uh, but then when you have children, uh, you know, uh, when they get to, uh, let's say they're in the grammar school era, you know, you're going to two soccer games every Saturday and your ability to spend time on other stuff like this sort of wanes. And then once they can start driving, then you, you know, it, it encouraged me to really get back and engage more deeply with, with Caltech. And uh, I knew some of the people that were on the, um, the uh, board of the uh, Alumni Association, and I, I spent time doing that. And you kind of go up the chain and become president. Uh, there is what, it, what we did in the olden days. And then um, uh, I, I wanted to, uh, uh, you know, from a philanthropic standpoint, I wanted to um, give back. And so I, I joined the associates and back in those days, they had a, a lifetime membership that you could buy, which was, uh, you know, one that would, uh, it, it was money that would generate enough, uh, to, to pay the annual dues. And so, um, uh, I've been a life member of that, uh, ever, I can't remember the date, but, uh, uh, when I could start spending those times and they, they have events, uh, here in the Bay area and, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I ended up getting recruited to the board and uh, that was uh, that was uh, really fulfilling as well. Between the Alumni Association, the Associates and the Board of Trustees, you really have a unique vantage point of what makes Caltech so special. So I wonder if you could reflect on a broad level 
what is it for you? What makes Caltech so special? Well, yes, um, and I think um, I think the uh, issue is that uh, uh, we're small and we're excellent, and we get the best and the brightest, and we equip them very well with uh, research capabilities. Uh, you know, usually a laboratory uh, plus, and um, then uh, they go out and make hay, and they uh, that allows probably what I would think, and I haven't, you know, checked this uh, academically, but it, it really gives us the capability to get involved in interdisciplinary and be effect, very effective in interdisciplinary research and uh, discoveries and that sort of stuff. Just a snapshot in time, what are some of the things happening at Caltech that you're really excited about? Um, Happening now or happened in the past? Um, no, right now, just a snapshot circa 2022. Well, um, LIGO has to, well, uh, a LIGO uh, has to be a good one. And in, in, in place of uh, really current stuff, uh, you know, the Seismo just had their centennial. But one of the things that was very interesting here in the past couple of years was the uh, repurposing of, uh, of uh, quiet fiber optics as uh, seismometers. And uh, that's, uh, that's been really good. Um, you know, a lot of the, uh, uh, I, I don't think I can name them in detail, but a lot of the biological um, and uh, electrical engineering, you know, sensors and uh, new biology stuff. And uh, the, uh, 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 you know, the, the things going on in, in, uh, in that area, um, there's, um, I'm trying to remember his name, but I, I don't, not that close to him, but he's really, really does some very interesting nano uh, science stuff and uh, those kinds of things. Uh, there's a there's a professor that I support, or I, I was my first uh, uh, endowment of a professorship to uh, um, Carrie Valhalla, who uh, does a lot of uh, photonics and uh, uh, um, uh, optical oscillators and everything else like that, very accurate and, and uh, and that sort of thing, and that, and he's he's had a whole cadre of uh, graduates that have gone out and are you know doing uh, extensions of that technology as well. Ted, do you see your work through either the alumni association, the associates, and the trustees? Is it all sort of intertwined, or are you careful to keep each of those connections in their own lane, so to speak? Well, I think it's <clears throat> I think it's intertwined because it's all at the same location, but. Um, uh, I, there was one other thing I meant to mention, which uh, was when uh, when I was appointed when I as a as a alumni president and as a associates president, um, you are an ad hoc member of the um, board of governors for the Athenaeum. So uh, I when I was appointed as a trustee in 2005, I think David Baltimore twisted my arm to stay on the board of governors at. Uh, at the Athenaeum, and uh, I've done that ever since. And I've uh, I've also helped with uh, what we call the um, um, AAPF, which, which is called the Athenaeum Architectural Preservation Fund. And uh, uh, that's something where we've been trying to raise some funds for uh, a raise of an endowment so we can uh, have uh, ongoing funds that will keep that as the uh, architectural treasure and uh, uh, functional treasure that it is to Caltech. And back to my point about interdisciplinary um, uh, synergy, we that that is one of the substrates for the professors to uh, to get together because it's a uh, it's very handy. The campus is small; everybody can walk there for lunch or whatever. Um, you know, they they actually had a a round table there that they called it where. A bunch of the senior professors, some Nobel laureates, would uh, I think it probably sat eight people. They would get together and not talk so much about science, but talk about things that were going on in the world and just uh, sharing smart ideas. And it was it was a little elite, you know, not everybody could go, but it was it was something that went on and on and on for quite a while. So anyway, and I knew some of the professors that were involved in that pretty well. Ted, as a trustee, in the ideal sense. What is the most positive and impactful way you can leverage your experience with helping Caltech? Um, I wouldn't 
characterize it as leveraging, but I think the fact that uh, the fact that I was a student here, um, I think that's one of the most valuable things in terms of helping with the trustees because I think education is a major uh, part of what we do. The, you know, the uh, research is uh, also, a, I mean, we have a huge factor of research compared to most uh, other schools and that uh, that goes on, but it's, it's um, I've always said that uh, managing the faculty is different from managing business because what we do is, as I said, get them equipped, find the best and the brightest, get them out there and uh, let them go make hay, I mean, in their in their fields. And so uh, that's that's one of the things, but I think uh, just the perspective on uh, really what's good for the students uh, and, uh, you know, how to be effective both from a research and a, uh, and a uh, uh, academic standpoint is, uh, is really pretty good. And in fact, one of the things uh, since I worked in uh, wafer manufacturing and whatnot, I worked in a lot of, I ended up uh, being involved in, you know, our facilities as we made new ones and built them and whatnot. And that ends up, I was on the building and grounds committee for, for quite a while and uh, uh, was recruited there because uh, we didn't have a lot of trustees that had uh, uh, the uh, 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 lab and uh, uh, construction experience. And so um, uh, I ended up uh, uh, spending time with that where I, I felt that that was, a, that was a contribution I made. And then uh, we started the student experience uh, committee when I was on the board. And the, the thing that uh, was important for me in that is uh, uh, it was motivated by some suicides that we had, and I don't want to get too heavy here, but um, I actually have a, a son who has a uh, a psychiatric uh, problem. I mean, he's actually schizophrenic, uh, manic oriented. But what uh, what it does is uh, you think about uh, uh, so those kinds of problems um, uh, come to life or happen uh, post puberty and young adulthood. So they're right in there. So those those can happen to our students. But um, I was concerned about uh, the psychiatric uh, uh, or physical. Uh, health uh, orientations that they had, because if you think about students coming to college, they're coming out of a, a pretty disciplined environment at home. Um, some of them have helicopter parents. Some are, uh, you know, trained to be uh, to take care of themselves. But you know, just in terms of uh, street wisdom and uh, 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 potential drug exposure, potential alcohol exposure and uh, just coming out and being on their own all of a sudden, um, the care has to be taken and they need to get going. So we actually started the student experience committee um, uh, during that period of time. And um, I think it's been a, I think it's been a, a good, uh, a good substrate for uh, working on some of these problems. And uh, I actually went to the uh, uh, freshman orientation once. Um, just to see how they had responded to the problems that we had seen. And um, I, I thought they really did a good job. And uh, the, you know, the, the best way to detect these things is uh, the friends of a, of a person that's having a problem need to notice something different. And then they need to encourage that person to go get some help and whatnot. So um, if they don't have the uh, training and they don't have they oh, he's just running off the rails, it's no big deal, you know, that's, that's uh, that needed to be uh, brought to light so that um, they would uh, they could really uh, get in and help these issues and so that's that's one that I think uh, as uh, uh, you want to talk about impact of the board I think that was really one of the interesting milestones that uh, has helped a lot and I think it's I think it's important I think it's going to be ongoing important. Ted, as an undergraduate yourself <clears throat> and as a trustee right now. Have you had opportunity to interact with with Caltech undergraduates and get a sense of their student experience? Um, I have, but not so much. I mean, it's um, um, they. Uh, I was uh, I was at Lloyd House. Uh, in those days, we called it a new student house <laughs> because it had only been there about a year or two before I got there, and uh, they actually suspended rotation, so there was no. Um, no, uh, we, we were just all randomly assigned, but uh, um, 
that worked out well. And so I, there have been times when I've gone back and uh, been able to inter, interface with them. You know, there's one person who's really done a super job of this, and I, I don't know whether it's still going on, but uh, Tom Mannion, uh, you know, has students to his house, uh, and he's, uh, he's one of the other uh, important uh, uh, channels for uh, helping the students make the transition from uh, discipline environment out into the uh, out into the open uh, wilderness, you know, if you will, of of, uh, of humanity. But uh, he he would have uh, student uh, dinners and whatnot, and uh, associates or not associates, but um, uh, trustees could be invited to do that. Um, and we do have them on the committee, and we do have them, but it's it's uh, it that's a more formal engagement and it's it's really hard to talk about that but um for example the uh, uh the uh, ist meeting that i went they had a couple of uh, students on the board uh, on the uh or at the uh, uh reception that we got together and so i was able to talk with a bunch of those find out what they were doing at the um double e um advisory committee we're going to have a poster session so we'll be able to and with students uh so we'll be able to go around and talk with them and they've got a poster and they kind of uh, uh just tell us what their what their research is about and what's going on and, and how it's going to make a difference so those are um those are important uh, uh interactions that uh you know give you a chance to uh to see those people in fact i've 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 kind of <laughs> i i turned around on one of them once this was a while ago where um, you know, they, uh, they really got, uh, a little too chatty and were on a course that was not going to let them finish and tell their whole story before, you know, we would have to move on to the next poster. And so I, I told them about the, uh, uh, about, you know, the, uh, elevator pitch and how to do that quickly so that you can, you can get your whole, uh, story across. And, it was uh, it was kind of fun. They 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 uh, one of the, after that group that group actually got together, and did some self training on how to do that. <laughs> Ted, coming from the world of business, which obviously is very different than academia, how would you differentiate in terms of your service as a trustee, management versus advice? Um, you know. Uh, it's uh, that's one of the things about Caltech that's uh, better integrated, as far as I'm concerned. I I took a business econ class, I, either senior or uh, my master's year, from a professor named Horace Gilbert. He came in here. He came to Caltech, I think, in uh, uh, right around 1930 or 1929 or something like that. Um, and uh, they told him his. He came from Harvard and his. His uh, uh, colleagues told him that uh, when he said he was going to Caltech, his called him his contact. His uh, colleagues told him that uh, Millikan was the Tausig of physics. Tausig was a famous <laughs> econ uh, icon in those days, uh, and uh, but he he actually really gave me the best introduction I've ever had to business. It was like a mini MBA and. Uh, you know, he told us about what the uh, we talked about. Well, what, what are the inter, what are the resources that an enterprise needs? And back in the day, this is what men, materials, and machines. And it's management's job to integrate those in the best way. He talked about the critical path of uh, of a um, of a project and how to manage that. And he talked about um, uh, let's uh, oh, and he gave us uh, things about the learning curve and how what the cost might be depending on the cumulative volume, uh, some charts like that. So it really, really um, gave a good job of melding the two together. But um, from a business standpoint, it's, um, it really is about leadership. And uh, one of the things about uh, Intel uh, was that we had Andy Grove as this, uh, as this, uh, leader he was started out as a chief operations officer and uh, really was running research and manufacturing as we got going but um, he said early on that we wanted to be a learning organization and we would 
we had this uh, uh, plan or this idea where we would send um, an individual out to a conference, you know, motivation, uh, you know, other other things, and uh, they would come back and teach the course. Uh, so I actually went out to a motivation conference and came back and I taught uh, managing by objectives to uh, a group which included Andy Grove, uh, you know, maybe a dozen people or something like that about, um, and we were really data intensive. So that, you know, having those metrics came in, but we really weren't, uh, had not been doing a lot of uh, work about forecasting, for example. So we ended up uh, uh, embracing that. And then, you know, all across the, the company, we had uh, a mission statement and uh, objectives and key results. And uh, we started doing that. We did that the whole time, of, you know, once we, once we, uh, uh, absorb this. Uh, I did that the whole time. And we ended up having people, I mean, one of our best uh, training things was uh, uh, how to run a meeting. And, you know, it was like three fourths of a day uh, uh, training session. And it was really basically like, uh, you know, organize it, figure out what kind of outcomes you uh, need, send out your uh, materials uh, at least 24 hours ahead. I work for a boss that if you didn't do that, he'd cancel your meeting and, uh, you know, get there on time. You know, if everybody's five or 10 minutes late, you're wasting a couple of man hours, you know, of, uh, of work and, uh, and, uh, you know, say whether it's an information meeting, say whether it's a, a make decision meeting or, you know, and, you know, just organize it in a, in a, in a good way to, uh, to do that. So we, we, we did a lot of that stuff and, uh, you know, different subjects and it, uh, it really turned out very powerful. So that, that kind of, uh, a culture I'd say, you know, uh, probably makes me who I am on the, on the board of trustees from a, from a, uh, uh, business standpoint. Um, but I mean, also in academia, I mean, we, uh, I worked at Fairchild R and D and made some, inventions of, you know, got, got some patents. And uh, actually in my last 10 years at Intel, I was a VP and a director of corporate licensing, which was really to set our whole patent filing strategy recognition um, and, uh, and then uh, negotiating licenses, you know, to um, not so much to gain money, but to get cross licenses because we had so much revenue. We were, <laughs> we were a big target. Ted, as a trustee, just at a very broad level, what are some of the most important metrics to consider when determining what kind of path Caltech is on? Areas of improvement, strengths to build on? Okay. Well, I mean, one of our best metric is uh, the number of Nobel laureates we have. I mean, I think that's, and, and, and as a percentage of our faculty, I think that's probably best in the world. I, I, we'd have to verify that, but uh, uh, it's certainly very, very good. And uh, doing those things is uh, is really um, really exciting. I mean, I, I think that's that's one of the that's one of the best things. The other thing is um, just um, the recognition that our graduates get uh, out there for for various things, uh, and a, a lot of them, uh, even though they're not involved. Uh, even though they're not uh, at Caltech anymore after they graduate, you know, there's there's a fair number of uh, Nobel laureates there as well. Um, so those metrics are good. I think, um, you know, other metrics, uh, uh, graduation rate is, um, I think uh, uh, the, uh, um, our yield on uh, those we, you know, those we admit is, uh, is probably pretty good, but uh, you know, a lot of students apply to a lot of schools these days, and so that's uh, that's a little bit murky from my perspective. Um, but uh, but those graduation rates, and then um, you know, I think uh, on our board, uh, you know, how we do from a philanthropic standpoint back to the school is uh, is an important metric. Um, I'm, and I think uh, I, I think I said graduation rate um, and. Uh, there was it, one that's a little bit uh, uh, dicey is, um, you know, how many go on and get PhDs in academia and versus how many uh, go to work because uh, 
I I was pretty oriented toward going to work, uh, you know, uh, ever since I got uh, got to Caltech. Um, and uh, I think that's more typical of engineers while, you know, the other more uh, scientific areas, um, you know, many of those do go on to, uh, 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 you know, get a PhD. And I, I think those 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 metrics are all useful, I think, in terms of uh, of uh, of really how we're doing. Ted, among the trustees themselves, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the value of having basically two kinds of profiles: Caltech alumni who are on the board, and then people who have just done very well who are in the Los Angeles area. They don't have a connection to Caltech except that they serve on the board. Um, yeah, and by the way, I don't think that's just uh, local, but um, I think having local people... I... And we're back. So, Ted, you were saying about I was asking about al alumni and then, you know, serving on the board and then people who are in Los Angeles. But then, as you correctly noted, there are people who are farther away who also serve on the board. Yes. And then um, but I thought that uh, having I, there's um, a lot is very positive about getting people to come back to campus. It does not have to happen all the time. But that allows, um, from a uh, from a personal standpoint, allows interaction with students and the faculty, and to see their uh, presentations and whatnot. So that's that's easy to do, and um, it uh, you know it ends up being a, a a very good substrate to get people excited about it because it, I mean, it's an attractive campus. Obviously, it's changed a lot since I was there. But um, uh, just uh, the whole social idea of getting face to face and whatnot is a is a is an effective way to do that. So that that is easier for those people. A lot of these advisory committees, yeah, they recruit people from around the world, but there are a lot of people that drive across town uh, for them. And uh, you know, one of the things that I think I've contributed in that environment is uh, uh, you know we. We need to, when we start these meetings, we usually have like a half an hour of greeting time where people can come and arrive at different times because if you're driving across LA, uh, you know, oh, yeah. it's, uh, it's very random. And then I always want to have a dinner before we kick them back out again, just because of the same, the same reason. I mean, uh, to, uh, to make that whole experience, uh, you know, really nice and not motivate people to, to, you know, to get off of it, so yeah, I, I think uh, I think uh, and I and just just having you know uh, business skills, academic skills, and those other things mixing from other places, I think is I think is very useful because you know when we're talking about dealing with problems, uh, you know it makes sense to understand what other people do and how they what other institutions do and how they deal with these. So yes, Ted, I wonder if you could share your views on where you see the role of philanthropy in terms of what's possible at Caltech. In other words, Caltech, of course, has a variety of funding sources. What does philanthropy, what do benefactors allow Caltech to do that might not otherwise be possible? Well, a lot of the, I mean, some of these large gifts have been um, just phenomenal in terms of giving us, I mean, the Resnick uh, gift of, uh, of, of that has really allowed building and uh, focus on uh, uh, ecological problems and everything else, which is and sustainability problems, which is really, really very important. Um, I was actually at the, uh, uh, I was, I think I was there as a president of the Alumni Association when uh, the Moore Foundation announced their, I think it was $600 million gift. Um, at, when we were at Smoke Tree at uh, at that meeting, and uh, the the thing about that was, uh, I had actually met him on campus when I was uh, uh, in the spring of my uh, master's year. Carver Mead uh, uh, actually uh, uh, suggested that, and uh, he had he had 
um, about a half a dozen of us, of his students, meet in a very small uh, room in Spalding. And uh, he told us, uh, you know, three stories about the kind of research that they were doing. And then he said, uh, hey, if you're looking for work, um, we're hiring. Uh, just uh, call this number and schedule a visit. That's all I did in terms of <laughs> getting employed. I'm going to I'm going to rattle on here a little bit further. Because no, please, it's please. A funny, a funny story, but um, they uh, two years after I started at uh, at Fairchild, uh, uh, Gordon Moore and Bob Noyce peeled off to start Intel. That was in July of '68, uh, and. Uh, uh, in September, uh, I ended up joining Intel, but it was the result of Carver Mead. Uh, well, Andy Grove and Gordon Moore met me for lunch, and they told me they were they wanted me to come to work, but um, what I was going to work on was confidential, and they 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 couldn't tell me about it. And I and I said, well, um, that's uh, that's a little demotivating. I mean, I'd like to know where I'm headed, um, and uh, so I said, do you mind if I um, talk to my advisor about it uh, and I'll keep it confidential with him and we'll see. And that was Carver. So I called Carver and we we're talking about this and I, he said, I, uh, and I said, uh, you know, they're recruiting me to go to Intel, but they can't tell me what it is. And uh, do, do you think that would uh, make sense for me? And he said, uh, yes, I do, because you're going to be working with me and Jim McCaldin on zinc sulfide light emitting diodes. <laughs> And I says, oh, my God, really? And then we talked about it. I actually had to put together a little lab down in Pasadena up on Walnut and uh, was on the second floor. I had a I had a nice evaporation, uh, you know, uh, vacuum system for that. But otherwise, I had to build a little bench in there and uh, whatever else to to put a little uh, furnace up and other things to, to build on this. But. Uh, that's how I ended up at Intel. It, it didn't quite pan out. This zinc sulfide didn't quite pan out as well as I, I thought it might. And I ended up going back after about uh, six months uh, of uh, working and living down there. And uh, I ended up uh, doing the initial work on uh, our bipolar process, which was sort of the, the second uh, most important, but it was the first one that got done. So. He had a 64-bit uh, stand, uh, static random access memory SRAM, and that was our first product, product probably in about 69. But the uh, the thing I told, uh, the, the speech I gave at Carver's 70th birthday, I think Milton Chang had that at his house in uh, Los Altos Hills, a uh, good friend of mine. Milton's a great, uh, great guy. Um, anyway, I said I was trying to think about what I was going to say about Carver, but I said to me, I don't think I could have gotten a better uh, employment agent because <laughs> 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 you know I never worked outside of anybody else's organization to try and Gordon and Carver's the one that facilitated both uh, <laughs> both connections. So anyway, sorry that was not at uh, all, not at yeah. all. Ted, from your vantage point, both as a student and for all of the ways you remain connected to Caltech, what do you think it says that Caltech has always wanted to remain small when it always could have gotten bigger? What's the story there? Um, I think it's the uh, interdisciplinary uh, cooperation and the other thing of just getting the best and the brightest and, uh, and doing it. Um, and and making those discoveries and uh, and impact, and um, I think uh, well, first of all, I mean to expand in our neighborhood would be hard. I mean we'd have to we have to buy a bunch of residential stuff, and the capital would be would be very large there. And I I, I think we're already, I mean to a certain extent, one of the things that uh, would be a a great discussion to have is what fraction should we be of education versus research? And um, I think we're at a pretty good uh, ratio right now. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, as a consequence, I mean, obviously we do, uh, percentage-wise, I think we do a lot more research than any other, uh, any other uh, institute around. I mean, I would, I would have to, we'd have to, say, take a look at the MIT numbers and see what, uh, 
how much research they do compared to how many students they have. But I, I think, um, I think we'd have to, I think we, I think we'd be more research intensive than they are. The other thing that's good about that is it means that we have quite a, uh, fractionally, we quite, we have quite a, a, a large number of professors relative to the students compared to a lot of other places. And that gives the possibility for great mentoring, uh, uh, of students, and uh, I think that's uh, I think that's another possibility that comes out from our from our overall uh, size that we have. So yeah, I think that's I think I think we're in a sweet spot, but I think we should uh, I think we should analyze it from time to time and uh, and com you know compare us. One of the one of the things that uh, uh, I I don't know if you've ever heard about this uh, total quality management. But one of the things that you do when you're interested, in, the whole idea is to do a root cause fix when you're working on something. But when you do that, you go uh, uh, take a look at a lot of benchmarks to see what other people, other institutes in your in your same area are doing, and and compare that, and also look at uh, you know procedures that they put in place to to make themselves better. Ted, as you mentioned earlier, of course, Caltech has changed quite a bit since you were an undergraduate. At a broad scale, what stands out in your memory? What are some of the biggest ways Caltech has changed? Um, well, um, probably the probably the biggest one is uh, um, adding women to the students. I mean, that uh, there were no uh, females on. Well, I think there were a few grad students, but. Uh, um, in terms of undergrads, it was just us, and I, you know, making that transition was uh, a little tricky because, uh, you know, everybody we had this student house system, where um, you know, I mean, in those days there were just seven houses. I mean, there were four before I got here, and that was it. Now there, then there were seven, and the idea was to you know get all of the undergrads on campus um, uh, because they liked the way that was working. Um, so that that is really one of the bigger changes and that whole shift was really kind of hard because if you think you've got you know somehow they repositioned these houses to also handle women as well as men and uh, that was tricky i mean especially if you think about bathrooms and stuff like that and uh, and also uh, you know none of the rooms had their own showers you had to go in and uh, use a common one in the in the restrooms on there so you know <laughs> and they they didn't really completely re uh, repurpose that but that doing going through that was a was a big challenge to make it uh, you know safe and respectful uh, of all of those so that was one uh, one big thing I think um, I think other things I mentioned LIGO earlier but I mean some of these big uh, exploration things and that was a that's a, 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 a project that we work on in conjunction with MIT but uh, Huge, huge government uh, government support for that, which uh, which has turned out well. Um, you know the thirty meter telescope, the ten meter ten meter telescope. Uh, you know that's that's been a great uh, great thing. I, as a kid uh, in grammar school, I remember when they were uh, put the stuff up at Mount Palomar and. Uh, that was uh, in Life magazine. They had a nice article on that. You could see the pictures of these big trucks carrying that uh, that lens up there, and uh, it was uh, it was actually ground in the uh, in the place uh, just across the uh, just across that walk on the west side of um, of uh, Fleming House, uh, what's Firestone now, but it was a different building there then, and they. Uh, that's where they that's where they ground the whole thing and made it and you know then trucked it down to Mount Palomar. So those are some of the those are some of the bigger milestones that I can I can recall. Ted, more recently you mentioned the impact of welcoming women as undergraduates here. What's your perspective on the relatively recent decision on renaming and what we learned about Robert Milliken? Well, as a um, as an old person, you know you. Uh, and, and I, this this happens across the whole demographic. Um, you know, the older people just don't want change. They, you know, one of the things that you could say about Milliken, and uh, by the way, the other thing we decided was we're not putting any of this history 
a way, you know, we're going to bring it out and, That's right. and, uh, and stay with it. But, um, you know, if you think about, I mean, they, and I, th I think from the history we read, I, I'm not sure that he was, uh, super active in the, in the ways that the human betterment foundation, uh, decided to do things. But I think they, I think for, um, uh, for recognition, they wanted, uh, they wanted to recruit, uh, uh, icons so that there would be people, people, strong people's names behind what was going on. But, you know, their thesis was this, or hypothesis, we can call it, was, um, you know, we probably shouldn't, uh, have, uh, it mentally ill people reproducing. And, you know, they were just thinking, I mean, this is back in the eugenics period too, which I'm not going to get into that, but I mean, you could argue that this kind of made sense. I mean, from on a couple of fronts, first of all, uh, perhaps some of the psychological problems are, uh, genetic and there, there are factors there. Um, but they can also be, um, environmental, uh, uh, things or how they're treated. But, uh, so the idea was that, um, let's, uh, let's go ahead and sterilize all these because the other thing is if you have a mentally ill uh, parent, um, you know, with a child, that's probably not a great, uh, great situation either. So the basic idea was, you know, we're going to sterilize the mentally ill. And I think this human betterment foundation, um, if I'm remembering the numbers correctly, they've sterilized 30,000 people. And, uh, as time went on, uh, you know, we found out it was more complicated that, and the, and the uh, a matter of, uh, of, uh, how they're treated, what the environment is, and they basically decided that that was that was uh, not a good idea. So, as as we get on into this period where political rectitude becomes uh, more important, and um, actually, uh, one one of my colleagues from Intel, as well as uh, 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 Caltech, is Bill David out. He wrote this book called Overconnected, which uh, uh, says that all of this incremental medium, the media that we have is, uh, uh, causing us to overreact. It's giving me positive feedback, uh, as they, and not positive in a good way, but positive as in a higher number way of, uh, encouragement. And it makes us uh, a little more, uh, makes us more partisan. And, uh, there's other factors as well, I'm sure, but, uh, that that has made this political rectitude uh, more important, and uh, you know, I mean, there are ugly things about our history that uh, you know. I'm talking about uh, Confederate statues throughout the South. You know, it's probably at a point where there are too many of those, but um, you know, you there's there's pluses and minuses to this. I mean, one of the ones that comes to my mind is having grown up here in California. And this is not a Caltech one, but it's a similar kind of deal. Um, Junipero Serra is the one who led the uh, the building of all of these missions that we have from San Diego all the way up to Marin County. I think there's around 40 of them. And uh, that ended up being uh, probably the first interactions that, uh, 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 shall we say, uh, Europeans had with the Native American Indians. And uh, they did not treat them particularly well at all. I mean, that's why you hear you know, Columbus Day, you know, we don't know. Let's call it Indigenous uh, 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 Americans Day. And, you know, this gets into this high sensitivity of back and forth. And, um, you know, we we uh, gave a lot of uh, a lot of uh, positive to the the missions thing that went up there because it was a it was a reasonably wholesome way of interfacing with uh, with the with that, uh, um, with that community, but, uh, you know, they, they learned about a lot of stuff, uh, uh, you know, things that the European society knew how to do, but then they were also, um, you know, probably mistreated to a certain extent, uh, with uh, how they interface with them. And so do we take Knippero and Sarah's name off of, uh, all of this stuff or do we let it run or whatever? And it's, uh, you know, the, some of those are tough questions about what to do, but I, I agree with what we did with uh, Millican. In fact, on the IBM or on the, uh, sorry, on the Athenaeum board of directors, we actually decided 
we, we had three places where Milliken's name was, or four places where Milliken's name was in the, in the one was the Milliken Suite, which uh, was one of the four suites that we had. You know, we have an Einstein, a Hale, a Noyes Suite, and the, and the Milliken Suite. Um, we had a big discussion about whether or not to change the name on that. Um, and uh, uh, basically we decided to do it and uh, we ended up uh, changed, somebody proposed JPL. I wanted, I, I actually proposed the one that we picked, which I says, why don't we name it after one of their really no, notable uh, uh, missions? And I said, uh, you know, this Voyager that went out there to look at, uh, we had two satellites that went out there to look at uh, uh, Saturn and Uranus, and then they're, they're way beyond, this is in the 70s, and now they're way beyond the heliosphere, and they're still sending back information, very low data rates, of course, but they're still selling it, sending it back. And the, the PI, Ed Stone, did that. Then he became uh, the director of JPL, and he also, uh, uh, but he, he remained as the PI on it. Then uh, he, uh, 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 when he stepped down as the director, he was still the PI, and he stayed on that until just in this last year, uh, uh, as the Voyager. So we renamed that the, uh, the Voyager suite, but we, we kept Millican, uh, noise and hail in the big, uh, uh, painting in the, uh, main dining room because it was such a factor. Those three guys were such a factor, in, uh, turning Caltech, uh, from the trade school it was into the, uh, scientific school that it is today. And then, um, uh, uh He's a Nobel laureate, so we left that one on in the Heyman Lounge. You probably haven't been there yet because it's, <laughs> I know it's been open since you've been here, but uh, uh, we have that one. And then he was, uh, he was the president of Caltech. So uh, we actually, I, I think he's timed out in the, uh, in the uh, lobby as you enter the dining room, but uh, uh, he was there as well. So we, we decided those were, those were uh, critical to remain, but uh, I, I think, uh, all across where we've uh, changed some of those things. It's been, uh, it's been very well handled, uh, very close look at the accurate uh, history and everything else. So I, I, think, I think the process all across campus has been really pretty good on that. But I have to tell you, um, there, was a, there was an alum who, uh, a good benefactor of Caltech, and he was really upset that, because uh, he, contributed some money to the Millican suite and he uh, was was not happy with the fact that uh, you know we changed the name but. yeah not everyone is going to be happy there's no doubt about it right right but you know I think I think we've got to um, consider our reputation and uh, and uh, you know the trademarking that we do um, is uh, is is important. So uh, I'm 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 okay with that. I think we but we we have to keep the history up there because I think it's important for us to know. And it, if you look back on what they what they did, I mean, I think it I think it um, I can, I can't I can't I can't criticize Millican for having done what he did because I, it was something that you um, made some sense, and uh, I think there's something to it and. On the other hand, um, you know, it uh, it becomes a little too sensitive, and you probably don't want to throw, um, you know, wedges into uh, your, uh, you know, how people view you. Ted, I'd like to now turn to some high-level questions as they relate to your career and areas of expertise. So to start maybe at the most foundational, as a self-proclaimed hardware guy, where does that put you on the spectrum between electrical engineering and computer science? Well, um, I think <laughs> I'm, well, first of all, I, I really am more of a, uh, uh, solid state physics guy. Um, you know, when you, when you work on these, uh, when you, uh, as I was working through with, uh, carbon, well, let me go back even further. I was, a, I had an amateur radio license when I was in junior high school and, uh, I had a, a really a best friend that I met in junior high school. And uh, we're still great friends. He ended up going to Santa Barbara, became the first engineering grad there. And uh, 
uh, and ended up uh, going to work for Hughes uh, uh, Satellite Stuff in Santa Barbara. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we just stayed together. We worked on cars together. We worked on, and so uh, all of this hands-on stuff was very important. Neither of my parents went to college. They were both uh, uh, pretty good. My dad was a welder. He did original welding at Lockheed and uh, uh, on aluminum. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I worked on a lot of projects with him at the house. I mean, he would weld stuff up. He built our, uh, um, uh, our laundry uh, 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 drying uh, system and built a big swing set for me and my brother. And, you know, we, we put in a pool when I was 10 years old and did a lot of the work ourselves, you know, contracted it out. But so I'm, my point is a lot of this is hands-on the physical stuff. So the, I probably had a bent in that, uh, I built heat kits. Of it, so I probably had a bent in that, uh, in that direction. And uh, uh, I, as I got into this, by the way, the other thing about ham radio is um, uh, back in the day, you know, transistors were worthless for uh, high power and high frequency. So vacuum tubes were really the best way to go. And I, you know, you could, <laughs> I bought high power ones for my transmitter for 29 cents a piece at a surplus store in, in Burbank. But this this kind of put me on the hands-on thing. So uh, when I was at Double E, and you know, by the way, as an undergrad in engineering, um, they don't just uh, make a distinction between um, uh, mechanical engineering or electrical engineering. I mean, it does. It, they do after a while because you, you go on one path or the other. But um, you know, your my undergrad degree is uh, engineering. You know, not engineering, not electrical engineering, but. Working through there, I got uh, I got into um, you know I took uh, material science courses. I took uh, 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 I took um, uh, you know some physical uh, some device physics uh, kind of thing. Carver was working uh, on um, a metal semiconductor contacts, so you know I got exposed to that and. Uh, and when I uh, when I got ready to graduate, I started uh, 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 saying uh, I, when my when my colleagues found out that I was going to go to work for Fairchild and Semigas, says Ted, you you said those things were awful, and you know uh, what do you why are you going there? And I said, well, I think the timing's about right, <laughs> and so I I ended up wanting to do that and. Uh, uh, so that's how I that's how I got into the thing. And by the way, in those days, I did take a I did take a computer science class, and we had a IBM 7090 7094 at, that took the flash that took the cards you know that you put in there that was how you you, you had a stack of cards that was your uh, program and uh, told the machine what to do. But they also made us um, work on a on a what was known as a Burroughs 220, and it was, um, uh, it didn't have an operating system. It only had a 10,000 word drum memory. To put the, uh, put your instructions in, we had paper tape, which had uh, eight dots there, which was uh, how you, <laughs> how you put the bits in line to get it in there. And then when it uh, printed out, it, uh, it came out in a teletype machine. And that was, that was, uh, long in the tooth in those days, but it gave you a sense. And, you know, since it didn't have an operating system, you had to write the code so that uh, you told every uh, uh, command exactly where to put the answer and all of this and add it all back. But it was just complete thing. So I, I had, I had that, that was a one quarter course. That's all I, that's all I had to do with uh, uh, coding. And I just uh, never really quite got into it. So that's that's how I consider myself a hardware guy, and then I, you know, as I said, my my expertise really was uh, cooking the chips, and uh, I I actually got a a patent on a, a process that I mentioned when I went to when I went to Fairchild um, after you patterned the uh, aluminum that you had on the chip, then they went through a process they called alloy and. It was 550 or 565 for 10 or 15 minutes, degree C. The, and, uh, you know, I, as I'm saying, I said, gee, I, why, I wonder why they call this, I'm saying this myself, I wonder why they call this alloy, um, you know, because it does not get to the eutectic temperature. 
and uh, and uh, you know so there can't be any alloy. So I I did what I call a Friday afternoon experiment. I took a wafer, put a little in type wafer, put a little in plus in there, and I could end up taking a look at the different contacts uh, with uh, uh, curve tracer. That's that's what we used in the old days to check and see you know, what the breakdown voltages were, what the, you know, what the characteristics were of the, of the devices we had, transistor gain and stuff like that. Anyway, so I'm, uh, and this was bipolar transistors, this is not MOS, which is, MOS is mostly what we use now, uh, metal oxide semiconductor versus um, the bipolar, which is NPN and PNP transistors. Anyway, so I'm looking at these and I, um, and I, uh, uh, Put the metal on there. I pattern it, and I before I alloy it, quote unquote, I look at the uh, a couple of the uh, connections, and um, one looks like a diode, but it's just really, really, you know, like this. And it's um, and I so I said, hmm, that's that doesn't look good. So anyway, I I wrote my comments down about that, and I took them into alloy, and I brought them back, and I um, look at this. Uh, look at this connection and uh, where I have the lightly doped in type and uh, it looks uh, just like a diode it's uh, you know and it, it is a very smooth curve now it doesn't and then I'm looking at the forward uh, voltage of this diode and it's only about three tenths of a volt and a standard NPN junction or an N, uh, NP junction would be about six tenths of a volt so I, because of my experience with carver and metal semiconductor connections I said this is a Schottky diode. This is, uh, you know, we can use this and we don't have to gold dope the wafer anymore. You just have to gold dope the wafer to cut the lifetime down so that it could switch back quickly. And uh, this would be a, what they called a Baker clamp you could put on there to keep it from uh, forward biasing and putting uh, minority uh, uh, carriers into the, into the slot that you'd have to suck back out when you change the switch. So it wasn't the, I was working on linear integrated circuits. So I took it over to my friends in digital and said, Hey, here you can, here's a way you can make these, uh, <laughs> make these diodes and, uh, and you don't have to go to open anymore. Uh, took up a little more space, but it was very simple to put right over the right, right in parallel with a collector base junction. And, um, uh, uh, I, I, I got a patent on that and, uh, I, this is probably making the story a little bit too long, no, but, no. but, um, um, when uh, Carver came up, Carver was consulting at Fairchild R&D, so that's how uh, that's how uh, you know he has a connection with Gordon. So uh, he came up there and he he told Gordon, he says, "I'd like to have lunch with you and a couple of my students if we could, and so just invite them as well." So Jeff Wise, one of the guys that was in that room with me, also worked at uh, Fairchild. He was working on the on the transducer part of the thing. Uh, where they, you know, with silicon, you can make an infrared uh, light emitter. And uh, we were there at lunch and I had just come up with this. So I said, hey, Carver, you get a kick out of this. I just, uh, you know, I told him the story and he says, what, really? He says, we've got to call this the Jenkins diode. And I said, no, no, Schottky already has his name on it. <laughs> but at any rate, and Gordon says, what? Tell me that again. <laughs> so. It was uh, it was a it was a nice uh, invention and a and a and a fun thing and uh, since I mentioned Gordon here again there there have been some uh, there's been some fun times the uh, when I was uh, when I was I had already said I was going to retire in uh, in the fall in the spring of '99 um, I was uh, doing some stuff at another building uh, which had was one of our larger ones that had a cafeteria. I was sitting there, I sat down by myself and Gordon comes by and he says, hey, Ted, can I join you? I said, sure, of course, you know, like, and uh, so he sat down and uh, we're, uh, we're talking away there uh, and, uh, uh, and, he's, and finally in a little bit, he says, guess what? And I said, what? And he says, I'm 70 years old today. And so this was January 3rd, 1999. And, uh, I retired in five, five So I could, uh, it would, so I could remember it. And if, uh, and if they didn't have a party for me, it was Cinco de Mayo. I could find one somewhere, but, uh, he, he told me he was, uh, uh, 
70. And, uh, you know, this year we're talking, uh, uh, you know, so he's, he's, uh, he's, uh, well into his nineties, uh, or 93, I think is what he's actually at now, but it was, uh, it was, uh, he was, he was always a, a great guy. I, I, another, another time I saw him early on, I was, I, I think I was already involved in the alumni association or whatever, but, uh, um, one of our chemistry professors, uh, Bill Corcoran, um, uh, I happened to see Gordon and, uh, him, uh, walking out to the front door, said hello. And, and, uh, and, uh, you know, Gordon says goodbye to this guy. And I said, well, um, what was that? What was that all about Gordon? And he kind of, uh, giggled a little bit and he says they want me to endow a professorship which was the two million dollar gift back in those days and i think he did and it ultimately you know formed a a, a foundation and uh, you know and uh, ended up uh, that's where that's where that gift ended up coming from you know that i told you about it i want to say it's 2001 or something like that yeah Ted, I wonder, you know, you, ha you have such a unique perspective on this. You understand this, this really singular intellectual connection between Caltech and Intel. Is there a way that you usefully separate out in your mind what are the Caltech achievements and what are the Intel achievements? Is that even possible? Oh, oh yeah, because, um, um, you know, Caltech is not just electrical engineering. I mean, it's uh, it's everything else. And uh, you know, a lot of those things that I've uh, uh, that I've touted, uh, you know, are um, are you know, I mean, they might have some electrical engineering content, but uh, you know, a lot of other things as well. So, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, seismo, uh, LIGO, um, telescopes, uh, you know, all of that stuff is. Uh, is uh, very, I mean, you know, the stuff that Mike Brown did, uh, you know, uh, getting Pluto demoted, uh, you know, those are, those are, um, I mean, they use a, they use a, a group of things. I mean, he, he had a, a wide uh, vision telescope and, you know, he scanned the sky, scanned the sky, scanned the sky, and then he had a computer program that would identify, you know, some objects that were moving slowly. And uh, you know he could infer that those were planets. So I mean, there's you know it's it's that that's not a, that's that's not an Intel. Intel, um, I mean, probably their biggest deal was um, you know the way they uh, got the microprocessor working and then promoted it and uh, whatever. But uh, you know you mentioned Caltech and uh, Intel. There was a time when we had. Uh, five vice presidents at Intel this early on that were Caltech alums in one way or another. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jerry Parker was a classmate of nine. He was a, he was a senior VP. Albert Yu, who's passed away now, he was a student at uh, Caltech and, uh, you know, ended up uh, uh, well up in the management chain. Um, Bill Davidow, <laughs> This is a this is a funny story about David Al. I was pulling into Cal. I was pulling into Intel one morning, and I, I was still driving my old '66 Mustang that I bought when I was finishing grad school. I, I had gotten a. I, had, I had, my grandparents had given me some money, and uh, I ended up uh, getting a, a little bit of uh, some support from Caltech when I was uh, uh, as I was finishing my uh, degree. I think they paid half my tuition my my master's year. And uh, uh, the other thing that happened then was uh, uh, actually Webb Emery had been promoted. He was swim coach and water polo coach had been promoted and he hired me as an assistant coach in swimming and water polo. So I, I got to do that. But the thing that David Dow said is he saw my he saw the Caltech sticker on the back window of my car and he says, wow, Ted, I'm impressed. I, he says, uh, I went, uh, I was uh, at Caltech and was to work on my PhD and um, after a year, uh, qualified for a master's degree, but I decided I wasn't, was this going to be too hard to finish? And so I went to Stanford. <laughs> <laughs> so there was him. And then of course, Gordon was, uh, you know, uh, 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 uh VP at, uh, at, uh, at Intel and actually CEO for a period of time. And, you know, obviously he's a, 
he's a Caltech alum as well. So that's that's how that that was a I, from my perspective, I thought that was a very strong connection in terms of how small the school is and how small Intel was at the time. When you started at Intel, did you have any sense of what it was going to achieve? Was it already on that path? Um, you know, I did not because, um, well, uh, one of the, one of the things that I, uh, you know, people have asked me about uh, startups and everything else. One of the things that I think of, you know, you think of when you've got some good technology, oh great, I'm going to start a company and do that. But you need, you need more, you need, um, you need some product definition. You need to, you need to know how that technology is going to express itself into a product that somebody's going to pay pay for and buy a lot of and everything else. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm mentioning this because what Intel did with its first couple of products was they were, they were only memory devices. This was about the time to leave core memory, you know, the little magnetic uh, things that you can switch back and forth and, and test uh, into um, semiconductor memory. And the nice thing about defining uh, a memory product is all you have to do is pick a power of two that makes sense. You know, so we were 64. Our first MOS product was 256, and you know, then we went on. Our first DRAM was uh, 1024. So it's you know, it's it's one of these things that starting up. But as time went on, we ended up uh, getting a contract with. Uh, uh, a Japanese uh, calculator company, and uh, we had a guy, uh, Ted Hoff. I don't know whether you've heard about him. Sure. Marshall, uh, he uh, he's the one that figured out we we couldn't do that many different products, so he figured out one where we could actually reprogram the same chip to do these different functions that they wanted to do, and that's what set us on the path to um, doing the microprocessor and. Uh, um, you know, there were other people working on similar areas, but uh, I think we did that. And then the other thing that we were really good at was we had this thing called uh, the Crush Campaign, which was we made workstations and other kinds of stuff so that uh, users of the uh, microprocessors could uh, have easy ways to figure out how to apply them to, to their needs. So, um, and they called that, that was a Crush Campaign. And if we'd known what we know today about uh, uh, and I trust <laughs> think we probably wouldn't have used that, but, but at any rate, uh, so that's, that's, so we weren't really on the microprocessor trajectory as we were getting started. That's why I bring that up, but we, we were doing this memory stuff and, uh, and, uh, actually we had another guy, uh, Doug Froman that came up with this, uh, EEPROM, which was, uh, um, you know, a, a, a memory where we stored static electricity on floating gates in a MOS device. And, you know, that's, that's how, that's where all of this non-volatile memory comes from today. Ted, in reflecting on the profound ways Intel has influenced technology in American society, what are you most surprised at? Well, let's see. Well, wow. In a way, I'm kind of surprised that they lost their way here over the last few years. Um, and uh, what do you mean by that? How have they lost their way? They did not keep up with the silicon technology um, like TSMC and uh, Nvidia. Samsung. Nvidia. Well, Nvidia is different. Nvidia was a product definition, and you know, keep in mind they are they use a foundry, so um, they well they got access to TSMC so that's that probably gave them a, a, an edge there on that um, but um, you know we had a, a CFO came into well the the one uh, CEO uh, I think he had uh, some I hadn't have had a, a relationship with one of his uh, uh, female workers and uh, and uh, so he got tainted there and uh, got replaced, but was by the CFO. And I don't think they made enough, uh, 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 importance relative to the, um, technology for that period of time. And it's gotten very expensive to, with the new, with the new equipment that you have to have and, uh, everything else. But I think I have a, a lot of hope that this guy, uh, uh, Pat Gelsinger will get him back on track, but it's going to take a few years before, uh, before they can get these new buildings in place and, 
up and running, uh, you know, at a, at a good rate. So that's, that's probably one of my biggest surprises at Intel. Um, I mean, otherwise, I think we, we really did uh, pretty well for the good run there. I mean, keep in mind, I'm coming up on, uh, you know, 23 years of retirement. Um, and uh, I retired, I retired, you know, I was only 55 years old when I, when I retired, but uh, my wife had, had had breast cancer and my son had had this psychotic break and my uh, nice uh, stock option uh, had matured. And I just said, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to take care of my family here and uh, go out. And it, it's, it's worked out fine. I mean, I've had, uh, I've had, and, and I think that's another thing that's really made it uh, a little simpler for me to stay involved at Caltech is because, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm still working in terms of uh, helping Caltech, but I'm not getting paid. <laughs> the other, the opposite, in fact. <laughs> yeah. But it's uh, no, but it's uh, it's uh, it's 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 really been uh, uh, an enjoyable connection. So that was that's 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 uh, that's probably the biggest surprise about mm-hmm. Intel. I'm trying to think if there was anything else. I mean. We've had some others. I mean, non-volatile memory. I mean, I ran the memory division for a while, and I switched this from uh, uh, EEPROMs to uh, uh, flash memory, and uh, I shut down the E squared memory. But um, it, it uh, you know, I only did that for I think I did that for four years. But uh, I, I think that was a really good decision. I don't think it was a surprise. I think it was something that really made sense. But it was a, it was sort of a shift in the change there. And, and they've actually spun off their memory business. They're not in it anymore. Um, and uh, I, that's probably okay if they can if they can really get their technology back and keep their microprocessor um, design on, on track as well. I think that'll be a great area for them. Plus they're also going, so uh, Gelsinger's also said that he's gonna go to a uh, hybrid model here where they're gonna offer uh, foundry uh, uh, processing as well. Ted, you were really present at the creation for the idea of Moore's Law. What does that mean? And are we still in it? Is, is Moore's Law still being proven true year after year? I think I think Carver would be a better person to ask that question. Of, but it has, you know, it has really, it has, it has really changed. Um, he first proposed we could double the number of transistors every year and on a chip that we're doing. And that was, that was in 1965, I believe, if I remembering this correctly, I was, uh, and uh, 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 several years later, maybe more like uh, six or seven or eight, uh, he changed it to every year and a half. But you know, he started this just by looking at the, he did a semi log chart, you know, logarithm on uh, the vertical axis and linear on the bottom for the years. And, uh, he actually showed that it was pretty much a straight line, which allowed you to get into this doubling factor, um, you know, over the yearly period or every year and a half. Um, but if you, when I first started in the industry, um, it was, uh, <laughs> my wife is walking past. Hello, Ginger. <laughs> That's David. Hi, David. Hello, good to see you. You're doing an interview. We're having a great time already, just like I knew we would. Good. Good to see your face. <laughs> so anyway, the um, when I first got into the industry, 10 microns was the narrowest we could make. But um, now we're down to, you know, well beyond 10 nanometers. But the simple calculation, 10 microns to 10 man- nanometers, that's a factor of a thousand, right? Oh, but wait, it's a factor of a thousand in this direction as well. So that in that period of time, that's a factor of a million in density. Now keep going here. Our simplest uh, product was the MOS product. We could do that with four masks. Only had to go in photolithography four times. Later on, we put some uh, scratch protection on top. So that added um, five. But um, and the the bipolar devices were more than that, but now they're up to like 20 layers. They've got multiple layers of interconnect. They've got uh, they're even going into some 3D devices, which are ones that are um, you know uh, around like that. So and then we're probably down to a few. Uh, um, I, I want to say 
you know, three to five nanometers, somewhere in there. We're getting really close on the uh, atomic uh, dimensions. So we're, I think we're approaching a, a stop to this, but uh, Carver actually gave a presentation. I think it was maybe shortly after he retired. So that was a while ago and he talked about it and he, he mentioned how close, wh where we were compared to the, um, uh, you know, the uh, atomic distances. And we, we still had, you know, uh, not plenty, but we had a fair amount of space left. So um, yeah, I, think, I think we're coming up on, on a limit somehow. And, uh, you know, we'll just have to see what happens. And at the atomic level, is that just that we're simply running into the laws of physics at that point? Well, it's, uh, no, but I mean, you need for, for, for doing this stuff, sometimes, uh, when you put uh, reverse uh, voltage on a diode, I mean, you end up uh, expending a, a, or end up moving the uh, minority carriers out a little bit. So, you know, you, that, that takes, that's a space and you can't, you know, if you run into the next conductor, then you're, you know, you're going to have, you're going to have some troubles with, uh, with the way the thing functions. And so, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's the atomic law, but it's also uh, you, know, you know the law of electrodynamics because you you need to you need spaces for that stuff to go on to have these semiconductors work, and uh, and you'll end up getting stuck there. But Car Carver made this speech on it, and uh, it was really interesting. He you know, and since he's moved on to physics, <laughs> he could give you a much better answer about this than I can. It's also because I've been retired, and I'm you know I have not kept up in detail with. Um, um, what the current technology is and, and those different structures and everything else that's uh, going on. But it's, 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 it's like when you uh, are storing uh, stuff in your garage, you know, you, you get to so much and then pretty soon you have to start stacking it up. And that's, that's what they've done with the semiconductor process. Ted, as you well know, nowadays in the tech industry, it seems like people move around every year or two years. For you, having spent your entire career at Intel, what does that say in terms of generations? What does it say about you and what does it say about Intel? Well, I mean, uh, um, I was on a good ride, so I didn't really feel like uh, leading, uh, like leaving. And, uh, you know, since we were really ahead of the industry, I'd have to go back and take a look and see what fraction of the semiconductor business we were at that point in time. But I, I think we were really much larger than uh, a lot of others. Fairchild was, uh, Still pretty good, but they sort of they sort of changed and hung out with uh, with um, uh, you know individual <coughs> things. Ti has uh, Ti has had a pretty good run, uh, and uh, I, I you know I haven't I haven't really parsed that. But in terms of changing jobs periodically, I I think that's that could be a problem. I mean that that was a you know all of all of the um, uh, exempt people. Uh, and by exempt, I'm talking about California uh, labor law, you know, uh, that got and, uh, that got monthly uh, salaries. Um, everyone at Intel got uh, stock options, and uh, it was uh, one of the and they were, you know, you get this option, and you, uh, you know, uh, every year you could uh, 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 get a fourth of it and uh, and uh, and uh, purchase it, and you know, if the price is up, you could sell it and. So that 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 really uh, kept everybody hanging around, and it was uh, had a lot to do with uh, with the loyalty. Plus, you know, um, we really worked to get achievement done, and uh, we had a lot of good stuff going on at Intel. So everybody felt like they were, you know, um, uh, contributing and uh, being a part of that uh, achievement. And so, I mean, that was that was probably even a stronger motivation than the. Uh, or at least as strong a motivation as the minor of the a monetary one, um, but I th I think um, one of the things that's important in uh, a company is the a work culture, and uh, that's that's hard to uh, keep going when you've got people swapping out uh, around like that. So that's I, I I haven't seen any data on that, so I don't know what's what's going on. But that's I, I would say that would. That would be a weakness in your uh, labor uh, uh, resource. Ted, between the jobs that you worked at Intel and just the timing of when you were there, 
What opportunities did you have to see Gordon Moore operate? Well, when he was CEO, I mean, he would give speeches from time to time or, uh, you know, publish things. Uh, 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 really, pretty often. I mean, it, uh, it, uh, I mean, he's, he's a very, he's very reserved. I mean, he, I don't think he was, uh, if it were up to uh, him, he would not have called it Moore's Law. <laughs> Carver's the one that promoted that and got it, got it going. And, uh, and uh, was his best uh, advertising outlet, but um, yeah, he was he was available. You know, we always had a, a we always had a company picnic in the spring or early summer. You know, so we would get together and see people, and uh, you know, they they did do uh, a number of uh, social things like that that uh, that really worked. I mean, one of the things that I did when I was uh, uh, when I was uh, uh, VP and director of corporate licensing. I I had to set the the licensing pol the filing policy, and uh, one of the things that I did for recognition was every every fall we'd have a a, a party for all those people who um, uh, who had actually filed a patent. And, and you know, of course, filing isn't getting one, but uh, we had a very high record of uh, of uh, being able to. Uh, 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 get patents for the ones that we filed, and it was just a matter of getting everybody together. And I said, it, it, "I said we're our own entertainment here. We're here to have fun." And uh, and then I'd run a uh, during dinner, I'd run a running slideshow of the of the patents that we filed at that uh, at that uh, uh, location, and we we'd have one in uh, you know in in the Bay Area, and uh, I think I did one in Folsom, and then also down in. Uh, uh, I think I did. I think I did uh, uh, Oregon and uh, uh, maybe Arizona as well. But anyway, that we just have those, and it was to because if you recognize people publicly, they'll uh, you know that's they get a sense of uh, involvement and uh, achievement. But uh, I mean, you were talking about uh, Gordon's presence. Uh, I mean, uh, he would. Uh, I think. I think he his sense of, I don't think he came out to a lot of uh, events or, you know, or, or things like that, but uh, every, everyone was well aware of, uh, of uh, you know, what he was doing when he ran the company because, you know, I mean, he had to be involved in heavy uh, uh, capital expenses and other things like that. And, uh, you know, so you, you'd, uh, you'd see him fairly often. Ted, have you kept up as a as a former employee of Intel? Or do you still have uh, contacts there? You keep tabs of what's going on. Uh, to a certain extent, more from a social standpoint, I was uh, I was ch we have this uh, we have this group that start. There's two groups. There's the Intel retirees organization, and if you met the rule of uh, seventy five, you got. Um, uh, you had a uh, retirement fund that you could use for um, uh, 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 medical uh, insurance uh, um, uh, premiums. So um, the entire retirees, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a member of that, obviously, and, and stay involved in that. They have uh, they have some annual dinners, or uh, I, I'm not sure we, we that's some of this stuff has waned during this last period, but. They have some happy hours and stuff locally here that uh, I'll go to. And uh, so that's the retiree organization, but we also started one which was for anybody that ever worked at Intel called the Intel Alumni Network. I served as uh, chairman of that and uh, uh, and actually during the period when we uh, reached our 50th anniversary, uh, which would have been uh, 2018. And uh, we had a, a big, uh, event down at the Computer History Museum and uh, and did that. We we actually also got Gordon Moore to uh, video record a, a welcome, uh, you know, about 15 minute uh, video of him uh, welcoming us all there to the 50th anniversary. So that was good. Uh, we had sent a guy over there to, he, he's in uh, uh, Hawaii, I'm not sure you're aware, but. Yes. Uh, and uh, on, uh, lives in a, uh, community called Manalani and there's a Manalani hotel, but they also have a, 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 a 
neighborhood development next to them, which is, and Betty Moore has uh, fibromyalgia. So she really needed the warmth uh, year round to, you know, have less pain. And uh, uh, so they, that's why they, that's why they live there. Gordon, Gordon came back a lot to board meetings and, and stuff like that at, at Caltech, but uh, um, I think he's, you know, he's, He's got Parkinson's right now, and uh, uh, you know traveling is tougher. But uh, I have a good relationship with Ken Moore. I don't know whether you've talked to Ken at all. No, not yet. I look forward to it. And he's uh, he's a good guy. He's uh, uh, a major factor in the uh, Moore Foundation, and that's there on uh, you know it's, one of the things is that there's a you know when I talked about the associates mm -hmm. there, there's uh, various communities here uh, that where you have. Uh, different things like at the Athenaeum on, you know, most of the, uh, uh, almost all the associates are members of the Athenaeum there, not so much elsewhere. Um, and that's so that uh, they can get access to the Athenaeum. But um, uh, the, uh, he, uh, he would come back for board meetings and the, uh, uh, you know, he's, he's sort of uh, stopped doing that because of the, you know, all of a sudden, that's why he's a, a life trustee at this point. But uh, but Ken is Ken has stayed involved, and I've I've uh, been pretty close to him. Obviously, over this last period of a couple of years, I haven't seen him as much. And uh, but uh, hopefully, we'll get back get back together more. And I don't think he came to the annual meeting, did he? Uh, I don't believe so. Yeah, and. Uh, you know, he uh, he lives in the Bay Area here. The Moore Foundation is right on Sand Hill Road. But where I was going with this thing about communities was there's there's a big uh, community around the Caltech, you know, in Southern California. But if you take Silicon Valley here. I mean, we have I think we have five trustees up here in the in the Bay Area, and uh, a lot of you know David Al went into this entrepreneurial uh, work after uh, uh, after he. Uh, left Caltech and but there's a, a lot of people up here that do that kind of stuff and uh, so um, this is another hub of, uh, of uh, the Caltech community so we have we have alumni events there's this guy Peter Tong who uh, gets a seminar going every uh, every month and uh, that's on I think it's on a second Thursday th second or third Thursday down in the Bay Area um, I don't get to that as much but the I'm going to do an associates event uh, a week from this weekend that's going to be at the um, the uh, art museum down in San Jose and uh, you know so we'll we'll do that but uh, yeah that's uh, those those are the different those are the different communities and so you 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 really need to um, uh, uh, define the Caltech interface with them a little differently because you know, you can you can like tomorrow. I'm gonna I'm gonna go down to the uh, uh, to the Seismo uh, uh, event, and uh, you know I can fly in and out the same day. So, and you know, quite frankly, if you book your Southwest flights far enough ahead, you can get them for 40, 50, 60 bucks. You know, and uh, uh, and that's uh, that's that's cheaper than the hotel. Yeah, it's <laughs> true. <laughs> so. Um, Anyway, that's that's. Uh, I, did I answer your question? I think I might have drifted off. No, not at all, not at all. Ted, for the last for the last part of our talk today, I want to engage you in two sort of broad current events issues: one on campus and one more general to society. So, on campus, as you well know, computer science is now the dominant major among undergraduates. What is the significance of that, both for Caltech itself? and what it means in terms of what undergraduate students are interested in pursuing. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, uh, I, I don't think it's quite there yet, but it's, it's got to be a part of the core curriculum. And because, um, you know, regardless of whatever science or engineering people are working, there's, there's bound to be some uh, data analysis uh, uh, required. And uh, so you've, you've got to learn how to do that. And, uh, and I, you know, to a certain extent, uh, I think Caltech actually started a little bit behind on this. Um, 
But the thing that's uh, the thing that's really been doing well, Adam Weirman, I think, has done a, a really good job on this of pulling us up to speed and getting things getting things going. But there, uh, it's going to be tricky. I think we it's probably something we need to um, um, do some uh, uh, strategic long range planning on because it's. Uh, it's 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 going to be a disruption for us. We're going to have to have some people on there. But and the other thing about computer science is uh, it's technical, but it's also an art form. I mean, you have to take a look at how you um, structure your codes and everything else, and uh, how to do all that. And it's and it's uh, it's uh, it's going to be something that uh, almost everybody has to learn how to do now. Just because. You know, I mean, we you, you look, look at the core curriculum, we've got math in there, we've got physics in there, we've got chemistry in there, and this is going to have to be in there as well because everybody's going to need to use it. But that doesn't mean everybody's going to become a computer scientist. I think there will, I mean, this uh, artificial intelligent, uh, 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 autonomous vehicles and things like that, they're, they're going to they're gonna require a, a lot of that and it'll uh, need to keep going. And, you know, I think you'll have some people that, you know, there'll probably be some software people that don't have to be hardware people at all, you know. Um, but I think it's going to be interesting in terms, I think the, I think the hardware computers are, there'll probably be some uh, changes there. I mean, you mentioned NVIDIA earlier. One of the things about NVIDIA is that uh, they had uh, graphic processors. So any, any kind of data that is in a, uh, is in a two, three, four dimensional, uh, 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 state, uh, you know, you're going to need to uh, you're going to need to do uh, coding for all of that and those kinds of things. So it'll it'll have a little little bit of a hardware effect uh, as well. So that's going to be there. And um, I mean, and that's one of the reasons I like uh, I like Gelsinger in there because he's he's a he's a architectural guy on the on the processor. But for us uh, humans. Um, you know, I mean, they're already talking about the chip availability effect on cars and stuff like that. But this software is going to be uh, a really big deal as well. And I think, um, I hope, I think one of the one of the big challenges is this uh, crypto and uh, and uh, an invasion of the uh, of our uh, you know our information uh, systems. Uh, that, that, that's that's going to be an ongoing threat, and I think I think this I think the incremental media uh, uh, that we have and that effect on society is going to be a major one. Uh, one of the things that I did uh, early in retirement is uh, well, I went to uh, Aspen Institute um, that was on uh, uh, conference, and it was on. Um, uh, basically you know electronics and computers and stuff like that and i met a communications professor there from sac state uh which is just down the road here a little bit uh, uh and uh her name was barbara o'connor and she, uh, she asked me to uh, uh come to her class which was a uh, advanced communication talked about the technology um and uh so I spent a, a couple of a couple of sessions there, and she asked me to join her permanently. And so I taught with her for ten years as an adjunct professor at Sac State. And what we talked about was the um, the effect of advancing technology on society. And we covered a lot of things like privacy, you know. And there's also a legal component to this as well. But I mean, if you're if you're out in a um, public area, and you know you're getting video recorded uh, continuously. Um, uh, you don't have an expectation of privacy because you're out there. I mean, people can see what you're doing. So we we talk through all of these things with our with our students. We got <laughs> most of our most of our material from the New York Times, <laughs> just talking about things, and even you know even stuff would come up about uh, 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 Google. Uh, couldn't start its app in China without allowing them to censor searches. Mm -hmm. You cannot search for Fulong Gong. And so the, the kids, uh, the students were taught, hey, Google's a, a United States company. Um, they, uh, you know, they have to uh, align with free speech. 
and I said, uh, don't you guys know anything about sovereignty? And you know, I said, China can have it the way they want. But I mean, even if they do that, I think a little bit of Google is better than no Google at all. And you know, so we, we those were the kind of of uh, of discussions we had, and uh, it was uh, it was it was very interesting to see you know their reactions to a lot of stuff and what we were able to come back and and talk about and and where these things were going. And because this guy was a communications professor, and I knew the technical thing. I mean, one of the things that she said early on was. Um, uh, we need uh, universal access to the internet, just like uh, for telephones. And I said, uh, yeah, but inter uh, access to what uh, data rates? I mean, we don't have enough capacity for everybody to have a, a video connection or maybe even an audio connection. I mean, this is back in uh, 99, as I said. And uh, so I said, uh, I think everybody should have access to internet so they can do, um, uh, email, but I mean, I think that's it for right now. Maybe we, as as the technology changes, maybe we can go to other stuff. But it's it was uh, it was an interesting period of time to talk about that, and I really enjoyed uh, you know uh, getting together with the students. Uh, it was uh, it was uh, I think it was uh, one day a week, and we would uh, and then we had this uh, uh, blog like thing on email where we had a email address that went to everybody and. So we would get up there and discuss various things and uh, and did a lot of our, our development that way as well. Ted, last question for well, so let me let me just wrap up. I oh, yeah, the, I think the thing is there are uh, we need to stay aboard on the societal effects of this yeah. advanced technology and uh, really what that means. And I think uh, I mean, I could certainly forecast that uh, uh, all of this media is causing a problem. There's things we things we need to do to, to calm down our whole cohort here. I mean, you look at what went on up to the election and everything else, all of that behavior. I mean, a lot of that really has been amplified by this uh, incremental and independent uh, media. So I, I don't know what the real answer is, but I think uh, probably like everything else, uh, some sort of regulation uh, to a certain point and, uh, and maybe uh, uh, certain algorithms that will, you know, keep things a little calmer. Ted, on that point, last question for today. As we survey the tech landscape, things seem very unsettled nowadays with Twitter seemingly melting down and as you alluded to, the, the semiconductor shortage and the supply chain issues. Drawing on your deep experience at Intel, which was such a rock in American society, what's a way out of our current challenge right now? What are some of the things you might draw on? Um, yeah, well, um, semiconductor capacity, I mean, we had, we had problems with that for the whole life of Intel because it's related to capital expenditures, you know, and at the beginning of a, of a, of a, uh, of an economic cycle where you're moving up, um, people really go crazy on, uh, capital expenses. I mean, they're buying a bunch of new equipment, and everything else to expand, to get new technology, et cetera. And we used to have a lot of pressure on our supply in those days. I mean, even so, it's not it's not just a current. And and the other thing is, when you get to the peak of one of these things, um, people just don't buy anything else, and uh, you know it goes down. I in I wanted it's like 1974 or five. Um, I I we looked at a whole. We we had a, a business uh, uh, going down. And I had to, I actually ended up laying off 30% of my hourly staff. Um, they were, uh, back in those days, it was all women, uh, all, you know, uh, people working in the lab, photo, lithography, diffusion, uh, 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 thin film deposition. And um, I organized it in, in a way that I really tried to minimize it. I did, tried to, or in a lot of these, a lot of the layoffs, people will, uh, these companies will do one every Friday and, you know, and so people s sit around and talk, well, who's going to get laid off today, blah, 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 blah. And I said, I just wanted it all to happen at once and uh, say, and then I met with them and said, I've, we've done everything I can to minimize that this is going to be it. Our best thing that we can do to help this company is go back and make sure we're doing as well as we can. And it, um, 
I think it was really very effective, but I had to argue with my boss about doing it this way because they wanted to, you know, sort of peel it out over time. But I, I just, uh, I just didn't want to do it that way. So, um, that, uh, that was one, uh, that was one element that, uh, I think was in the, the, the ultimate, the question was what to say to again, that what, what, just how things feel so unsettled right now in the tech industry and drawing on your experience seemingly from a time of much greater stability, what lessons we could learn. Yeah, well, my, my first point was it wasn't completely stable, but you, need, you really need to uh, integrate the business with, uh, with what you're doing. And um, I think, uh, I mean, it really, really requires high quality, um, introspection, uh, you know, so that you do that. I mean, um, you know, Musk was actually a, a Caltech, uh, uh, commencement speaker. Yeah. I don't, have you been back to look at that? I have. It's, it's amazing that he did it. Yeah. And it, it was, I mean, and, and he wasn't, he wasn't super successful. I mean, it was, he was doing pretty well. I mean, he was clearly on a good track, but, um, it was, uh, it was, it was interesting, but I, I think we've got to. I think we've got to figure out how to. Uh, probably more strategic, long-range planning. We used to do one every five years at Intel SLRP. <laughs> it's what we called it, Slurp. And um, it was to say, okay, well, where are things going? What are we going to do? How do we deal with this? And I, I think um, these companies need to be a little more introspective and uh, come up with some some plans and whatnot that'll do it now. Clearly, we've, there's a lot of dy dynamics, and you've got to respond to that. But you've also got to decide which of these sectors are going to be the the sweet spots, and which are which are not going to be. Um, and I think that uh, I think that somehow we've got to feed back um, uh, some sort of social skills to a lot of people and teach them to a lot of people, so that we get into this. Uh, on the on the one hand, on the other, I'm I'm a Libra. <laughs> So, you know, that's the blind uh, scale holder. <laughs> and, but I mean, it's we have to get into this mode where we collaborate, we brainstorm, we throw out good ideas, and we come up with the best solution working on that. So we need to get societal norms um, relaxed a bit, I think. And uh, doesn't mean we need to relax from driving for success, but we need to... Uh, we need to relax uh, psychologically and uh, and from a team standpoint, I think uh, much uh, much better than we have. And how do we do that? Um, uh, I think I think uh, healthy leadership is certainly a good role. I mean, um, in the olden days, I thought religion was a factor just because it's uh, a separate. Uh, uh, authority that gives you uh, support in the same wholesome uh, personal values and uh, behavior. Probably. But I, I mean, the thing that we don't do so much is, uh, is this brainstorming and, uh, and thinking about stuff and thinking about some ideas, running some experiments to find out which is going to be the best way to go. I think that that's the methodology that we've got to get back to. And the only th place I can think of it coming from and where we are now is, uh, um, the leadership from management, and uh, uh, but I think that's I think that's probably where we need to go. Um, I don't know. What do you think? Oh gosh, I, I I'm I'm with you. I you know leadership is uh, we need good leadership. That's the start. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And uh, but I mean, look look at what happened with when we. Ha I mean, I don't want to go political on this, but I mean. Look what look what happened with uh, you know voting Trump in as president and uh, and then all those various uh, all these various uh, intensity in these different directions. It's uh, it's it's uh, it's it's not the way to get things done. It's not. Well, Ted, on that happy note, we'll pick up next time. We'll go all the way back to the beginning. Trace your family background. We'll take it from there. <laughs>